Really quick, I'd like to welcome everybody to, uh, they've titled this, Where's the Beef? How Producers Can Drive the Future of Cattle Markets. And right now we've got five really awesome individuals who represent their own, you know, their own individual brand, their own individual business. And they're all really, they're basically experts in their field. And it's really nice to be able to have them up here and have them offer their perspective and their viewpoint of what's happening with the beef industry. I mean, it's as everybody knows, if you're in this room and you have to deal with cattle, you know, it's been a rough uh, summer, to say the least, with the cattle markets going as crazy as they have been. Uh, I'm sure everybody had a wonderful calving season in some kind of form of blizzard, you know, followed by some rain, drought, or some mixture of, uh, you know, the, the third level of Dante's Inferno this year for cattle. But with that being said, I want to introduce our panel. We have Natalie Kavoric. Then we have Jody Hanson. We've got Rod Greiser. Did I say that right? Yeah. Okay, your name's it's spelled weird. I have a hard time with that. Then there's Jenny Peters. She was just on the last panel, amazing. And we've got Alec Ibach. So these guys, if they'll maybe kind of tell a little bit about themselves, where they're at, where they're from, and we'll just start with Rod and fire away. Um, I'm a fourth generation farmer rancher from southeast Kansas, kind of on the edge of the Flint Hills, and uh, we run mama cows fall and spring, and uh, weaning background everything, and still have the bad habit of feeding out cattle, and, uh, and then we run a grain operation too. I've got uh, two older brothers I'm in partnership with, and uh, my son and my nephew are back doing the grunt work now, so. All right. I'm Natalie. Um, thanks everyone for coming. I know there's a lot of other good talks going on right now, so it's nice to see some people here. <laughs> um, I currently live in central Nebraska, but I am a Nebraska transplant. I was born and raised in southwest Montana, um, fourth generation on a registered Hereford operation. Um, I moved to Nebraska when I met and married my husband, um, and we run a cow-calf operation in central Nebraska. And then most recently, um, with a childhood friend, I started a ranch direct uh, direct to consumer beef business um, and kind of do that online on social media. All right. I'm Alec Iba. I am a uh, sixth generation farmer on one side, fifth on the other. Um, I'm from central Nebraska. Kearney is where I live, but we farm and ranch in Sumner, Nebraska. Uh, farm corn and soybeans and row crop, a little alfalfa and Sudan grass um, for feed. And then we uh, have a cow calf operation. and. Um, over, a little over a decade ago, we um, transitioned our, our conventional herd to a um, uh, more maternally uh, oriented and uh, focused on uh, quality and carcass genetics. Um, and so now we run a all natural and non-hormone um, cow-calf operation and uh, market to the uh, same supplier um, year for the last eight years. Good afternoon, I'm Jenny Peters from Bellevue, Iowa, like Jared said. Uh, my husband and our four children, we have a diversified cow-calf operation, uh, which is predominantly Angus, Simital, a little bit of Red Angus base. Our main endeavor is probably our bred heifer development program, which keeps us uh, pretty bit busy. Uh, we have corn, soybeans, and alfalfa, the crops that we grow. Uh, most of the corn is fed back into uh, our cattle in the forms of uh, high moisture corn, silage, or earlage. We do sell a little bit of uh, cash crop uh, beans. And uh, before that, I guess I was uh, not far from uh, broad. I guess I grew up in uh, the uh, western side of the Flint Hills in Kansas, went to school at K-State, and uh, majored in agribusiness. And I guess I was fortunate enough that's where I met my husband, who was uh, there in graduate school. So happy to be here. I'm Jody Hansen. I, I'm in North Central Montana. I got a cow-calf operation. We also raise uh, wheat, malt, barley, peas, and lentils, a little bit of irrigated alfalfa. Our cow operation is mostly a cow-calf, get rid of the calves after about five, six months, and then winter the cows on the place. And if farming and ranching wasn't enough, our side gig is we, we do a outfit and a guide outfit business. And I ref college basketball, so feel free to yell if you like. <laughs> oh, this is great. Can you see us? 
Okay, yeah. I can't hear, but I can see. <laughs> <laughs> all right, real quick, let's. Uh, there's a real cool thing whenever you know with all the technology. I'm sure a lot of you guys, have, you know, on your phones constantly, and there's just so many things that are in our world nowadays. And you know, social media, a lot of the things that are out there allows this connection between the producer and the consumer, or it could allow that connection. And a really cool thing that. You know, Natalie's done with Ranch Wives Beef is some of the some of her connections using technology. What what are some of those? Can you give some examples of, of how that's worked in your business? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think when I think of social media, I think it's really important that we remember that all the platforms are all equally um, important. Uh, so YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and you know TikTok or whatever else is out there. Um, they allow us to tell our story, and I think that's a very general term that a lot of people are saying right now. Um, so if I really sit down and think of what my home's in Instagram, that's kind of where I sit at. Um, and if I really sit down and think about you know what what I'm doing on that platform, um, going deeper than just telling my story, it's really showing up every single day um, to remind the 98% that aren't involved in agriculture of the humanity in um, agriculture and that behind every plant and every animal is a face and a person and a family um, who is who is raising that animal or growing that crop and I think it's really easy for consumers to forget that um, you know there's this disconnect between them and social media between them and us and social media allows that bridge to kind of be get, um, gapped or that gap to be bridged sorry um, and so I think we also like to talk a lot about the power of social media and what it does for us, you know, as producers, but I think we need to remember it's also a very pow powerful tool for consumers. Um, and a lot of them have a lot of questions, you know, they want to know things about the food they're eating. Um, and now social media gives them that tool to go direct to the source. Um, we get questions all the time, um, people DMing us all the time. Um, and so I think that social media does a really great job of an open line of communication in a very transparent way. And I think it does a lot for, I feel like there's kind of a broken relationship between consumers and producers right now. Um, and having that communication and that transparency is gonna do a lot to, to fix that. And, and we have to remember how important our consumers are. Um, and that you know, the future of our industry isn't just reliant on keeping the relationships with the people we have good relationships with, it's also very reliant on welcoming back people who have we've either lost or who haven't you know, had any connection with agriculture at all. And that's really what social media allows us to do, is to maintain the trusted relationships we have with consumers, um, but also welcome new people into, into our space. And, and that's who we want to be bringing in, into that space, is the people that you know, haven't been a part of AG. Yeah. Have any of you other guys used some tech to kind of reach out and talk to consumers? Well, I, I think um, as a millennial, uh, technology is going to continue to evolve, and I think it's just um, doing our part to make sure that we're sharing that story. I think that you know, storied agriculture, if you want to brand it at that, is becoming so popular. People want to know where their food's coming from more and more, and um, I think it's okay to invite in um, you know, our consumers, what Natalie does, to um, you know, share our story and share um, where our food comes from and, and, and how, we, how we raise it in a sustainable way and a safe way. Mm -hmm. and so the more that we can share that story and the more that we can promote um, our operations um, and kind of brand our, our product as you know, um, the, the best product in the world, um, the better that is. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that uh, technology, uh, is huge for the beef industry. I think we as farmers, um, most of us are pretty hard workers, and we just want to go out and get the job done. And we, technology has had this boost in the last 30 years, really. Uh, and so we've gone with this technology, and we've kind of forgot to tell people why we do what we do each day. So a little bit of the beef industry, I think um, we're playing catch up. And that's OK. But um, we need to continue to tell our story and tell people you know, that we have a wholesome, uh, wonderful product uh, that is great uh, source of protein. 
and, um, and just telling our story, um, that's how we're going to have to get it done. I know with us, the, uh, a big thing is the communication between other farmers and ranchers. So for instance, if you've got a set of, so you got a trailer load of heifers to get rid of, you can throw that out on Facebook and a ton of people will see it right away. And nowadays everybody's a visual person so they, they can see what the, cow, the heifers are, they can see what they're gonna get, colors, everything, shape, and then they can get back to you right away and, and pretty quick you got a line of communication going without making a phone call and without you know word of mouth. It might go across the nation or it might go across the driveway, but the phones and the computers will get a lot of work done for you that you don't have to leg work. I suppose for me, really, the, I, the technology, I'd come at it from a different angle, not so much from the social media, but the value that, uh, I, I guess it's appropriate to, I use superior livestock a lot for video uh, purchasing, and it's, I, I think that's changed, uh, um, this sure changed how I manage my operation. I get a lot of uh, ranch direct cattle. Uh, I know the source on them, and uh, I've built uh, relationships with those reps that I know that vaccine that they say is in them is in them, and, and it's, so it's, uh, that part of it, that, that's kind of old school technology, I realize we're talking some other stuff, but from a technology standpoint, that's changed my game. Yeah, well, it's all relevant because it all affects how we do things and how everything works. And, you know, one of the things that we run into when you have technology, you think, oh, this is going to fix all these problems. But there's still the basic element of challenges. Like, what are some of the, I guess to Jody, is what are some of the challenges that are, you're faced with in the industry in today? Like just, I mean, I'm sure everybody can relate to them, but what's unique to your operation? I think first and foremost, um, uh, the biggest challenge for our industry now is getting the youth and new, new farmers and ranchers involved in the game. Because, I mean, everybody's getting bigger and wider, and there's getting to be fewer and fewer names on the plate. So if we can figure out a way... Um, either with government help, you know, maybe, maybe making it a, a, give some tax credits if somebody wants to pull some money out of, out of a 401k to help start buy some equipment, buy some, purchase some ground, buy some cattle, whatever. Uh, we need to get more youth involved into this industry. I mean, we're all getting older and it's getting harder and harder to get on and off the tractor and under the equipment. Um, you know, I, you know, I made some notes. Let me pull out a couple notes here. <laughs> Technology's awesome. I know it. <laughs> yeah, that's see, right there. That's technology solving the problem. One of the challenges. So I, I know one of the biggest, um, I'll speak from my, my, uh, my operation, is one of the hardest things I have is finding a buyer for the calves when I want to get rid of them. And, and that's why I'm real excited about FBN. If they can start up some sort of marketing program here where we can, where we can you know, shoot out what we have and, and a buyer may look at it and say, okay, I want to take a look at these guys. Kind of like, you know, it's the social market thing. If we can get, find avenues to market our product quicker and better, it, it'll just increase the value of everything. To add to that, I kind of had the exact same thought with maybe FBN and uh, how they could work together in the cattle industry. And it's creating, so one of the, I think, the challenges that we're facing is making sure that we're creating um, new markets and making sure that we're, we're marketing our product to consumers that, that want it. So if FBN, uh, if, if we can figure out a way to, to meet the demands and the challenges of those emerging markets, whether it's you know, natural, non-hormone, organic, wherever you're going, you know, conventionally, you know, for those raised beef or price sensitivity, um, whatever it be, if we can figure out a way to bring a community of people together in order to create those markets and develop those su supply chains, um, it's just going to be a better outcome for the producers. You bet. And consumers. Yeah. Well, anything that, that is good for anything is good for the producer is good for the consumer. Although it typically works the other way in a lot of the industry. <laughs> Any other challenges you guys have? Rod, I, I've <laughs> I've got a question for you. Um, one thing I know we talked about before this was was you know as you alluded to get some more young people in the industry. So. What are some of the obstacles you see for young people to have a barrier to, what's the barriers to the entry, to the industry? 
And if somebody can't maybe go out and buy a whole ranch and get started with that, that's a pretty yeah. big feat. I mean, it's yeah. obvious to everybody in here, unless you've never been on a cattle ranch, or it's so capital and intensive that it, that you really, I, the, the most, I've seen a couple success stories where uh, maybe not even a younger person, just, it, it's not age relevant, doesn't matter, but uh, where someone, uh, recognized an older person who his family maybe had probably left, you know, gone to the city and weren't interested in the farm or the ranch anymore and kind of mentored up to those that older person and, and really became the right hand man and and I know I know of a couple instances where uh, at the end they were at the they're at the end and they, they inherited the whole thing. Um, and, I, and, and, and the motivation was right. It wasn't, they didn't go in there with the intent. It was a surprise to them. But uh, there are those cases out there. And uh, outside of this, go, I'm not sure that a young person can go buy, borrow the capital without you know, you know, winning the lottery to, to get into the cattle business. I think you had to be a creative and find somebody to work alongside with and I understand that's not not the cure for everything, but I've seen it work a couple times. And so, if you're a young person that's really interested, that's that's what I would suggest. You kind of you kind of pay attention to your community and and uh, build a relationship with some some older person that's uh, you know doesn't have heirs that are interested. And you know they'll they'll get to the point where they they'll depend on you if you will be that person. They'll want, they'll want to pass the tradition on, and, and yeah, they, you know, if you were there to allow it to be handed, that's that's a, that's a beginning point. They they want to see their operation uh, maintained, and and they would love no, no, nothing more than to let uh, a young, young person, you know, do that. So I uh, just just something to think about if you are that person. Mm -hmm. We know this this crowd is well. This crowd probably isn't. I'm I'm impressed about how many young people come to this conference, but the cattle business is aging. So uh, I think those opportunities are out there. What What are some ways that you guys know that people could be involved? Maybe not directly just buying cattle, but like there's other parts of the industry. I mean, what are some of those other parts that you guys know of? Just open open question. I mean, we like to tell people because we get asked how they can. You know, support. They say buying beef. Yeah. It's like the easiest and best way to support yep. a, a rancher or a farmer is you know, buying our product and using it. Or buy cattle from the cattlemen and then go have them butchered. That's, you know, that's right directly from the deal. And you, and you do something similar to that? Yeah. Do you want to talk about what it is to, to do that? Like the realities of actually having a retail based business that you do on your own operation? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, we're fairly green. We started in 17, and um, that's actually when we started, like, storytelling and building our brand. We didn't actually start harvesting until 18, because it takes a while to kill an animal to the end state. Sorry. Um, so we're still learning a lot, but, um, we, I mean, we ship nationwide, so it depends if you want to keep it within state lines or if you want to cross state lines. Um, if you're going to cross state lines, the most important thing is, is finding a, a harvest facility that's USDA certified. Um, and then really after that, a lot of the regulations come down to state specific. So my business partner in Montana has to do a lot of different um, policies and, and uh, work that I have to do differently in Nebraska. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it, it's um, I think the biggest challenge is obviously, um, I mean, she's located outside of a, a bigger city in Montana, and so she kind of has a, a little bit more of a direct access to people who are willing to spend that higher um, cost for that premium product, but um, for me being in central Nebraska, I really had to work hard to get my product um, in front of the right, uh, you know, the right buyer, the person, not everyone, not everyone's my, my consumer, my, my uh, target customer, so um, I've had to spend a lot of time coming down to Lincoln and Omaha um, just to, to find that right consumer, and so, um, you know, telling your story is the really easy part, you know, showing up and Bring my audience along for what I do every single day on the ranch is the easy part. Um, I'm curious, are you selling uh, quarters and halves, or are you? We do. We have that or, option too. Or you yeah. sell just you can buy just a steak package or a hamburger package. Yep. Or we have both options. So, um, you know, we have like a, a larger local boxy brand that's um, almost like an eighth. It's a 
pretty popular for local customers because uh, storage capacity is really hard for people. Not everyone has, you know, I grew up with a freezer in the garage that was full of a, a whole beef, but not everyone living in the city has that option. So uh, finding that, that uh, right amount that they could store it. Um, so we do have that option to buy quarter halves holes and then the eight for local, uh, eighth is kind of too big to ship. Um, and then we, we offer the, the possibility to just, um, I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into uh, finding the right actual package size and um, insulator and working with dry ice and, and figuring out the ratio of, of beef to ship to dry ice. And there's, there's no manual out there. Like, you kind of have to really figure it out on your own. And so, um, you know, if people wanted to buy two steaks, they, they could, but we like, put a cautionary thing on our website that's not really recommended because probably saw. <laughs> um, well, and do you find yourself, you, if you sell, everybody loves steak. Everybody's like, I want a steak, I want some ribs. You know, those are like the real cool cuts. But what do you do with all the hamburger? Yeah, I mean, it, you, you learn so much <laughs> when you do this um, because like roast sit around and hamburger is hard to move. And, and also when you actually like sit down and look at what uh, the quantity is harvest per animal of the different ratios between the different cuts, you're like, oh, how am I going to market this? Um, and a lot of people aren't familiar with a lot of cuts too, and that's a huge barrier is trying to get those cuts that people aren't, the average consumer is not familiar with, um, to get them to purchase it. So we really try hard to like sneak those products into like curated bundles, um, and and like take the work out of it for the consumer and say like, hey, here's a flash sale we're running, and kind of sneak in those those the, the cuts that we have extra of into those and, and kind of make it easier for the consumer. That's real interesting. That's like the real side. Everybody talks about, well, just sell your stuff directly to the consumer. Okay, that's great. But you just heard like the reality of what that involves. It's not like all, oh, it's not as easy as it sounds, you know, and that's, it's awesome that you share that. I mean, and Alec brought up something earlier as we were talking about your, your talked about natural beef or some of these things that you're looking at. Is that something that you see in the future that you might do? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, we're working right now. We do a little bit of, um, um, not on the scale that Natalie does, but we do do some direct to the consumer and, and Carney, and um, we face the same challenges. Either they want hamburger or they want steaks or they want, you know. But I think another challenge is, is you know, look what we're competing against on the protein sector. You walk into hy V the other day, and it's 11 bucks for a whole pork loin. And if you want a prime mm -hmm. rib from Greater Omaha, for, for the holidays, it's 160 bucks. You know, so I mean, when you're thinking about, uh, you know, how are we marketing our our? It's a premium product, and everybody knows, you know, beef is a premium product, and um, it tastes good, and it's it's marketing those prime, you know, those those premium products against those other um, protein uh, sectors. We just got to keep doing. Uh, our best to to promote a, a clean, healthy, wholesome product, and um, I think you're going to see a lot more of what Natalie's doing. You know, farm to um, farm to fork type stuff, um, and and uh, the, the little niche mar niche markets um, that uh, are going to continue to create uh, new new supply chains and new new product chains. Yep. Well, and you talk about all these the alternative proteins that are in the market. I mean, and so we've got to you know address the the elephant in the room, and that's the you know, and I hate to even say fake meat because it's not meat. It's the it's the fake the thing they want to call meat. And Jenny, what what are your thoughts on on this new coming wave? Is it a real thing? Is it fad? I mean, there was something that the industry should be worried about. Should we just ignore it? Like, where are we? What's your thought, and where do we go with this as an industry? Well, I definitely don't think it uh, should be ignored. Uh, it's definitely here. It's definitely real. Uh, there's two different, um, the cell-cultured uh, product, and then there's a plant-based product. Uh, the plant-based is uh, anywhere from uh, 20 to 30 ingredients, where beef is one. Uh, there's a lot of discussion. Uh, but I, I think as cattle producers, um, Bad mouthing or disclaiming uh, that product is probably not what we need to do. Uh, I think the first thing that we need to do is we need to ask, you know, why does that consumer, why did they even want to go there to begin with? Is it because uh, they don't like animal agriculture? Uh, they want to get rid of agriculture? There's something um, 
you know, that um, they don't appreciate with that. Um, and I, I, I think, again, we need to tell our story. Is the beef uh, cattle producers, livestock producers, are we good for society? You bet we are. So, you know, we take um, a less, uh, a less than standard uh, product, which is grain forage, which we can't consume. We put it into cattle, and we make a high quality protein, um, which is healthy and safe uh, for America uh, and abroad. And I think that's how uh, we need to go about uh, and moving forward with this uh, fake meat, uh, these different kind of plant-based products. I think, I think as a millennial, um, I'll go back to, I, I'm proud to be a millennial, but I will tell you <laughs> that. That's all right, rock it, <laughs> it's we, yours. We are into new fab, fads, you know, I, I have a, I have my wife's cousins are from Omaha and Lincoln here, and you know, they've, they've tried it and all that stuff, and they just did it because, you know, it was the, it's the new thing. But I think that once you look and really look like what what Jenny was talking about the ingredients here, okay? So what you know what is it made up? Uh, Plant-based protein is is highly processed, and so are they really going for the health part of it? Because if they are, definitely not more healthy than beef. And then on the other side of it is the cellular-based uh, products. You know there still needs to be color added to those products. And so I think once consumers start figuring out what um, this stuff is, I think that we'll probably move out of a fad in, in terms of the millennial generation. But I do think that it will stick around for the, the consumers that are more conscientious about um, animal agriculture and, and how they feel about, about that. So that's kind of my thoughts on it. And I guess I'd add to it, we, we never want uh, consumers, to, consumers to think that uh, all we're pushing is our own product. We, everybody has free choice. But I think uh, as beef producers, we want the consumer to be knowledgeable about what they're, what they're eating. And whether that is, you know, that the labeling is done correctly. So it says that it's an imitation product. Or it says how many ingredients uh, is in it. I think that is uh, the real meat act, uh, which is being uh, developed right now. Uh, you know, those are things that uh, that are important. Yeah, I would echo that. Um, one that um, I think that the alternative uh, proteins, people will try them, um, but usually it's out of curiosity, kind of like you were saying. I think that I mean, there, it's not new to the industry. They've been trying to bring out this product for a long time, and people continually return to. Um, you know, the industry they know and love and trust, and that's the beef industry. Um, and I'd echo what Jenny was saying, that um, I don't think we have to be against adding them to the, um, the marketplace. I mean, I, I know I personally stand for a food system that's built on choice. Um, I think that's the beautiful thing about living in America, is that we have freedom, and I would never want to take away, um, you know, food's a very personal choice, and people choose lots of different reasons of, you know, what they want to put in their bodies and why they want to put it on put that in their bodies, and I don't think we should be taking away um, anyone's rights to have different choices. Um, like you were saying, I just think it's really important um, that it's you know marketed correctly, um, and, and from not only a label standpoint, but also from like a media standpoint of the story that they're telling about it. Um, and I think when it comes to alternative proteins, the most important thing to remember is that, um, and I, I take this approach with like vegetarians and veganism and, and the whole aspect, that um, the loudest voice is not necessarily um, the like the representative voice. It's just the loudest one, um, but that doesn't mean it's speaking for you know the population just because it's being screamed the loudest in our face. Yeah, really quick, just uh, the panelists are always on the spot because they're going to ask questions. So I'm going to qu ask a question to the audience. How many of you in here have actually eaten an Impossible Burger or something of that nature? How many of you have actually tried it? All right, just a couple, two. <laughs> and, and the reason I asked that, because I had a friend that, that told me, and he said, because I was very much the same way, like, ah, you know, and who wants to eat that? It's cardboard, so and so forth. And he's like, have you ever tried it? And I was like, no. 
And he made a great point. Like, if we're going to have an honest discussion about how awesome beef is versus the other thing, we've got to ask ourselves, maybe we should at least go try it. Because we're talking about how bad it is. But, you know, and I still haven't tried it because it's not very good, I don't think. But uh, anyway, but it's, it's interesting. You, were you guys shocked that there was only two people in the audience that have tried it? No, no. In this room. Yeah, well, you're not in this room. But, but do you, do you, uh, Rod, do you, do, you, do you know, do you have contemporary groups or your friends that have, anybody you know has tried it? Well, I'm old enough. I got a daughter that's, you know, a millennial, and uh, she hasn't even tried it. And she graduated from KU, so if that tells you, uh, uh, I, I think, you know, the the narrative got pushed from somewhere. I don't I don't know where, but I mean, that thing came out of nowhere and was everywhere, and it didn't happen by accident. And uh, you know, we're up against somebody with some money. Uh, this wasn't just an accident that this thing flew onto the stage six months ago and hit every burger joint, every grocery store, and was advertised on TV. Uh, there are some people that really hate agriculture. And I would suspect if you could dig down through it, you would find that's who's behind this type of situation. But uh, that's just my... Uh, and That's I'd a, like to yeah. just add to Head. that. So um, when you think about we have a, um, a good friend who um, works for a company, and um, he came to us and he said, um, do you know that they have health insurance policies for our pets? So I think we're moving to a, a different era where um, people are considering um, companion animals part of their family. Uh, they're giving them human um, attributes and sometimes spending a lot more uh, on their animals or their pets, uh, you know, than they are uh, as far as health care and, and that type of thing for insurance policies. So, you know, is that bleeding into if they think that way for their pets, then are those the same people that they're thinking that, you know, the bovine, the horse, the sheep, the goats, those animals that are for our livelihood, um, you know, are they thinking, is that the thought process that those are also companion animals and is that, so, you know, that's a whole moral issue that um, is probably going to have to be uh, be tackled and be thought of. Somebody took their horse on an, on an airplane, didn't they? That was a yeah. companion animal? Yeah. I have a, a friend who refers to it as the Disney effect. The Disney effect. And kind okay. of how we're just raising our youth to have kind of like a dis distorted perception of, you know, human to animal uh, relationship, really, um, and kind of the damage that that can do to our future. So, and we love our pets too. We have a, you know, border collar working dog, but, you know, I let her on the back porch every night, and, um, it, you know, she's a, a good pet to me, but um, she's a pet, and I, I don't consider her an equal. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of ways we can go here, Jared, talking. But yeah. one, one thing we, I think we, you know, we're, we're kind of stumbling on here is our kids are being, they're picking up thoughts subliminally about animals and how they equate to humans. And, and we need to do a better job through ag in the classroom or to our school boards or making sure that some of this really radical information that's in our school books is, is that's false is not there, you know? We, mm -hmm. we have a responsibility as parents and grandparents to, to be active in that. We've kind of stepped back, or I think, and just let sort of let that happen and you know we got we got to be more proactive about protecting yeah well there's not there's nothing wrong with sticking up for yourself or your industry no. i think i think that's where it comes back i mentioned storied beef you know and how we're getting the, that's becoming such a, a a new thing we need to do a better job of telling that story but then uh reasoning or the reasoning behind what we're doing and you know these animals i i bet you i if I had a show of hands out here how many people spent nights in and out with their livestock this year during calving. Um, it, 
it outweigh the time they spent with their spouses, probably. So, I mean, we spend so much time, we invest so much time, and we treat these animals a lot of times better than ourselves, and we are producing them for a, a food product. So I think that needs to be in our story on, on the reasoning why we're, we're doing things the way we're doing them. That's a, that's a great idea and a great possible solution. Does anybody else have any, any solutions that can, you know, all the problems that we've mentioned, and is there anything else that you guys, like yeah, I, ideas that come to I mind? I got one thing. I think, I think almost everybody in here would agree. It, it's kind of like a, a battle now between good and evil, right? We got the environmentalists and we got the producers. And I would bet every one of us produce, producers take better care of the ground than anybody in the city realizes, right? If we don't have the grass, if we don't have the grain, if we don't have the cattle, we're broke. So we're going to take care of it as best we can. And so if it comes right down to it, we're the ultimate environmentalists. We're taking care of it, and we're making it grow, and we're producing off of it as best as we can. And it comes down, it's like the, um, it's like the fake hamburger thing, man. It's all about marketing. If we can market that we're doing the best we can do for our, for our planet, you know, we're keeping the water clean, we're keeping the air clean, we're producing stuff off the ground that, that's clean. Um, I think if we market ourselves to the world, we can, we can probably do better for our products. Yeah, and so using some ideas maybe is using that, like traceability in the industry is going to become bigger and broader and we're just going to start moving to that 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 area. I mean, you're going to see in 10, 15, 20 years, uh, my generation is going to want to know where their food was produced and why. Yeah. And so that the form of traceability is, okay, so what, how do we use that? And um, you know, I think that I, we should start, as, as producers, we should start uh, producing a product that consumers want and not a cons not what we think they need. And so utilizing um, you know, traceability and, and sustainability and uh, you know, all these cool fancy words, but then and, and putting it together, like I, I've said it a hundred times, but that storied, pro that storied product is how are we gonna use traceability in the future to, to reach out to our consumers um, you know, 10, 15, 20 years down the road? It's, I don't know what that looks like yet, but I, I know that we're gonna have to adapt to it. I'm, I'm with Alec on that, and I think this is where FBN can really come in and help us. Is right now on the farming side of it, we can, you know, we got an app on our phone where we can keep all our records for our fields, what chemicals we use, what fertilizers we use, what we planted, where it's at, rock in the field, who knows, a gully. We can do the same thing with with the cattle and the beef industry. We can keep records on this FBN app, and man, it'd be a lifesaver. Everybody's got our phones with us all the time, right? You can pull it up, and the next thing, then you can pull it back up a year from now and tell the cow buyer, well, these calves had these shots on a certain day. They had implants or no implants. You know, this calf was born on February 24th, God forbid. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, you can just you can keep your records, and you can, you can do everything that they want us to do just from our phone. And I hope FBN gets into it because it would be a lifesaver for a lot of us. I think a lot of producers already have that, that record keeping. I know I could say that 3206 is, I could tell you who her grandma is and yep. you know, a grandsire is. And so um, you know, when, it, when you have a story built around that already and you have, have the data that is, is there, yeah, I, I would love to just somehow utilize all this data that I'm, I probably have way too many records anymore. <laughs> but but you know, I, just, I know this cow family. I know everything about her. You know, and I know what that is going to look like, that steer calf out of that cow. You got the money ball, man. I, well, I know what that steer calf on that, on that plate's going to look like, you know. So, um, you know, I, 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 I think there's a place in the market for FBN to be involved here in the yeah. industry. So make sure you put pressure on FBN to join the livestock side, maybe, you know. One thing I've noticed, Jared, is the, well, I'm guilty. I got an Amazon app on my phone, and if I'm lucky, my granddaughter doesn't find it and hit the uh, buy now thing, you know. But uh, she's buying a, she's buying an Impossible Burger and shipping it to you. Well, she had her eye on the uh, uh, what's Frozen Two uh, uh, Castle, but anyway, you can't eat that. She, she no, eat that. so you know if the we know we know that the consumer is going hard to Amazon. 
and other online. How about, how about if we take our beef to Amazon? How about if we, how about if we can, how about if FBN can help us create the data, data link that Jane, my daughter can look on her phone and say, I'm going to order a half a beef or, or five hamburgers, whatever. And it came from Alex Farm in, in Nebraska. They've got, they're all about data. Yeah. Why not? Data like you know? And what do we do? We've lost our margin, right? The, the retailer and the packer have it. They got us right where they want us. How do we get that back? We go around them. Just like we did on the chemicals, just like we're doing on the seed. I think. Give it to them, Rod. Get it. <laughs> That's right. I, I, you know, I want my margin back, man. We all should. We should want that. You know, we, why we gave it away begin, uh, is, you know, don't start me. But anyway, <laughs> uh, you know, I think we have an opportunity yeah. to get back. Yeah. Really quick, I'd like to, we're running almost out of time, but it, has anybody got any questions? Anybody want to, yeah, yeah, we got one right over here. Basically, just you just market through social media. Um, and so It just, Man. if you want, if you, uh, if you think the consumer can handle watching that animal <laughs> develop, I mean, that'd be my only It'd Be some good editing. It's just saying, oh, I bought this baby calf. <laughs> I mean. I totally Real life. Agree. I think that's fine. Yep. I'm just saying you want to make. I, I think we got to be careful with the millennial generation of getting connected. We talked about that, or, or really emotionally connected. To, Sensitive to, for, for yeah, that. To, to some aspects of it. I I think the, I mean the idea is great. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I'm not Give me totally. A I'm just. I'm not. I think that's a great idea. It's really cool. I'm, you know have videos of them walking around and you know exercising you're talking about the fear of getting emotionally attached to the animal i think i mean i you could see that happening oh yeah me too i could um when our kids would bring other school kids out <laughs> arm i was telling these guys earlier one day we brought we turned the bulls loose and those other kids had no idea what was going on <laughs> you know probably everybody in here is <laughs> people don't know where they're a lot of people don't know where the meat comes from or the grain or what you know a, a loaf of bread comes from the grocery store Amateur most of you have seen the, the seen store. the kid cry at the fair right yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah you don't want to get that detached but you know i mean if they just get the just get a picture of of yeah. your herd yeah. Yeah. we just got we have to be open well, you you and honest. your feed truck and your herd that's all they want to know they want they just want to know that it wasn't a corporate feed yard yeah. that you know the corporates well, I know that that word pictures to say what an individual words. I mean and the other thing that we need to do is we need to make sure we're asking the consumers questions what do they want you yeah. know and then listen and right like I said we need to supply what they want not what we think they need and right. Natalie's already you're already doing that to, I mean right. to a, a certain extent so uh, that's speaking of questions we've got a couple more hands up Whoever in the back wants to yell first. Yeah, keep keep meat off the fake meat yeah, label. Protein. Yeah, hundred percent. You know what? To add on to that, I think we also need to push hard on our legislatures to get country of origin. 
Amen. People need people need to know there you go. people need to know the meat that they're eating come from the US or Brazil, you know? Then that, let them make the decision. Do they want the Brazil meat or do they want the US meat? Um, I think we need country of origin real bad. I had a little interesting thing happen. We uh, we got a little hamburger joint in our town and they prided themselves on feeding locally uh, raised beef and uh, it was butchered at the local locker. And uh, they were just booming away. They were full every day and I ate there quite a bit. And a couple years ago I went in one day and I had a burger. I said, I don't, I asked the cook, and you can walk through the kitchen and go to the bathroom. You know, it's that kind of little place. I said, "What? Something's different about your hamburger day." I don't, I don't know. We noticed it too. She said, she showed me the package, and it was. She said, "Usually our meat's nice and you know, hamburgers nice and bright red." And she said, "Look at this stuff. It was pale and pasty looking." I said, "I have no idea." She, I said, "You still getting it from the locker?" Yeah. Well, some time went on. And it didn't change, and I just kind of left it alone. Once in a while, they'd buy a cow from us, but it wasn't, you know, it's not no big thing. wasn't a, wasn't about that. And uh, well, lo and behold, we find out about a year and a half later that the locker manager got creative and decided that he needed to increase his margin, so he started substituting Cisco hamburger for the locally grown hamburger. I'm going to tell you people, I could taste the difference. Now, if every consumer in America can taste that difference, what would that do to beef demand if we weren't cutting our hamburger with this cheap foreign imported stuff? If, we were, if the consumer was getting the true hamburger that you and I know, <laughs> demand would be really good. Go ahead. I think they'd get it cheaper if we could go around the packer. <laughs> you know, to every time somebody touches it, it's just like everything, man. We, That's right. Everything we buy is a wholesale, and everything we sell, you know. So what, we I could sell it at wholesale and still make more money than we are now. Yeah. Every time somebody touches it, they take a piece of it. So back way back there. Yeah, right there. Great question. You know what happens up, uh, I'm from Montana, so what happens up there is there's been a few times I've contracted to, to uh, Alberta or Saskatchewan feedlots, and they'll, you know, I'll sell them out in October. They'll go up there and they'll background them, and then they'll come back to a feedlot in Montana and it's registered, or, you know, it's, it's USDA then, or it's uh, American beef. There's also been situations uh, the same feedlot will, will buy backgrounded steers that were born, raised, and, and their whole life lived in Canada, spent 30 days on the feedlot in Montana, and then their U.S. beef. So, I mean, you got to kind of keep a close eye on this stuff because there's so dang many loopholes. You, it happens all the, well, so, so, so you're familiar with it then. <laughs> Absolutely, but I think the consumer needs to know, you know, We've talked about following it the whole way through. If they know where it came from and, and how it's been treated, I think there's a big difference between beef going back and forth across the border from Canada to the U.S. than you know, Australian beef coming in or um, Argentina or Brazil beef coming in. They're just not the same beef. There's a list of 20 countries, I think, that qualify, like Paraguay. and Yeah. Uh, their health standards are not the same as ours. And, and there again, I think it's a, it's a record-keeping thing that we could really – we could do ourselves some good keeping track of where them cattle have been standing. Yeah, you guys took it hard during that hoof and mouth thing. Yeah, but I remember it. I was trying to get rid of some cattle then too and the market went bad. Yep. Genetic potential in beef is plays a huge role in quality grade and and whatnot too. So I mean, there's that. Really quick, and hand up the back.
I did the ID tags one year, and it was a lot of extra work, and I didn't get any extra money on the end, you know? That's I think, awesome. yeah, that, uh, that's a pretty common thing. I think, I think a lot of people have went down that road and it just doesn't, I think it's doesn't pay be, out right now. I think it's going to be what the industry is going to demand of us. So like we were just talking, uh, we can trace that beef from my place to Canada back to the U.S. or whatever, it doesn't matter. But if you got the ID card in there, you can trace them back wherever they've gone and how long they've been there. I think it's coming down the industry. I just, it, it's a big expense and it's a lot of extra time through the shoot. And, and if we do it, we should own the narrative. We should own the, the, yes. the yeah. rules of how you do this, not, well, the, not let it in, be imposed on us. Yeah, right. there's a concern, too, that uh, basically they know the entire inventory then. And uh, does that work in the producer's favor, or does that work in the media industry's favor, or the packer's industry? You know, uh, that it, it's like Moneyball guy said, data is everything. If they, we got we got to keep an edge in the market. If we give away all of our marbles, we got nothing. So, uh, that's a great point. You all know when you're feeding a cow or a, a hog or whatever, when it gets to a certain size, you got to get rid of it or else you're losing money, right? Well, if the packers know that and the buyers know that, they're going to lowball us when they see a whole bunch of beef getting ready for slaughter. Is there any other questions? That's oh, right here in the front. Are you computer science? Do you come from a farm and ranch? Okay, so you're already familiar with just regular maintenance and stuff like that. I think a lost talent. I think a lost talent across this generation is fixing things. You know, woodworking, welding, the trades. If you can learn something like that, let me put it to you this way: I got a I got a rep college and I got a, a um, hunting business to supplement the farming and ranching. So if you can find something that when you're not farming and ranching, to go make a little pocket money, do it, man. It'll, it'll get you a vacation. It'll maybe buy you a pickup or a tractor or something. Find something that you can do along with the farm. I'll tell you, I'll tell you right now, I wish I had a computer science degree. Yeah. I wish I, had, I knew way more about technology than I do. And I'm not you know, untech savvy, but I don't know half of what I wish I knew. I run in iPads, all this new data stuff. I, I just ran, I mean, anything, honestly. Just, uh, I don't understand tech as much as I wish I did. I, you know, how, how data is gathered. I, like I said, I don't know what I don't know. So I'm just, I know that I wish I knew more about technology, though, and I had a computer science degree. Really quick, we got one time for one more question in the back. Black Hat, you had a question? It's how you market your cattle. I mean, I, I know that our calves end up in you know, Europe, Japan, and domestically on the East Coast. So you know, there's a way that you can follow those cattle through. The same, same, same feeder buys them, they go to the same packer, and I know that where they, you know, the end users are using the beef that we're producing. So you know, why not utilize your, tra if we're gonna go into traceability, I'm just saying, I'm, you know, if you're not for it or if you're for it, if you're gonna use it, use it to your advantage. And that, that, that's a great point, and, and that kind of, we probably wrapped up there, but you know, again, you're hearing the future of the beef. You're hearing some ideas bannered around. You're hearing some things that 
that are possible, some things that are an issue, and I think that the guys and girls today did a great job, and if we could, everybody give them, oh, have we got another question? Okay, one more, I said one more, but here we go. Uh, I'll, I'll just comment and then it'll go back on to uh, the young coming back to the farming. I think, um, you know, we have three boys, uh, two animal science, one uh, ag biz, and then our daughter is, is going to go into animal science. So the future for agriculture is huge, but I think the challenge for everybody, not just in agriculture, is finding your gift and your passion and then honing in on that and using it. So if you say, yeah, I'm going back to the farm. Well, you better have uh, something honed in that you can bring back to the farm. Uh, you better have a gift, and you better know how you're going to contribute, because uh, you've got to you've got to add something. So um, I would say you need to find your passion. You need to find because um, there's you know there's producers. We produce the product, and then we sell the product. So there's people that are in the trenches every day doing it. And you know it's not easy. And then we've got to find a way to sell the product. So there's a lot of opportunity producing it in the trenches, manual labor, doing that, or selling it. So um, just for young people, uh, defining your gift. Because what I do, well, this guy probably doesn't do well, and vice versa. We all have our own gifts. I, I would agree, but I also think it's important to remember that um, I mean, we all know cash flow is a huge issue, so you might not be able to only do, you know, what you want to do, especially starting out, and so I think, I know my husband gives this advice to people starting out that um, it kind of goes with, like, finding that, a separate enterprise that can cash flow, um, so you may have to be open to doing things um, in the beginning that you don't want to do that, that help, you know, build the ranch and get you that, that money you need to eventually, you know, do what you do later on, so I do wholeheartedly believe that, you know, finding, like, you know, what your 10 year, 15 year, 20 goal, you know, your goal is, um, but also making sure you're focusing on like, uh, what doing what now, um, you know, to get you there. And it, it may not be exactly what your passion is. You may have to be open, you know, my husband did a lot of things on the ranch that he, he didn't want to do to be able to eventually get to, you know, what he wanted to do on the ranch. Well, with that, I think uh, these guys will be around. If you have any more questions, feel free to like grab any of us in, outside in the hall. It's been a great discussion. It's great to, you know, kind of kick these ideas around. And I wish we had more time to get more questions, but I think that they'll probably throw something at us if we don't get out of here. Pretty quick. So give a round of applause to these guys. They were great. Thank you, everybody.